So this video will cover the autonomic nervous system. Let's review just a little bit. If you look at the nervous system, remember we divided it up into different portions. First we divided it into the central nervous system and peripheral nervous system. Remember the central nervous system is the brain and spinal cord and the peripheral nervous system is everything else. The peripheral nervous system includes things like nerves and ganglia. We then divided those nerves up into different types based on where they go or where they are coming from. If they're going to or coming from the body walls, they're called somatic. If they're going to or coming from an internal organ, they're called visceral or autonomic. We also divided each of these up into two branches. One branch, the afferent branch, is a sensory branch. The other branch, an efferent branch, is a motor branch. So we have a somatic efferent, which is a motor branch, and we have visceral efferent, or autonomic efferent, which is a motor branch. Unlike the somatic efferent, the visceral efferent, or autonomic efferent, can be further divided into two divisions. One of these is the sympathetic, and the other is the parasympathetic. Before we talk about sympathetic and parasympathetic, I want to do a comparison of these two. So if we look at the somatic efferent versus the autonomic or visceral efferent. Let's look at the somatic efferent first. The somatic efferent nervous system is a one neuron system. One neuron goes all the way from the brain of the spinal cord to the effector organ. The effector organ is always skeletal muscle. So basically this is how we produce voluntary movement. We tell our skeletal muscles to contract. This needs to happen very quickly. So these neurons are type A neurons. If you remember type A neurons are heavily myelinated, large in diameter, and very, very, very fast. They also have to release a neurotransmitter in order to communicate with the effector organ. The, the neurotransmitter for somatic efferent is always acetylcholine. So one neuron system, one neurotransmitter, always acetylcholine. If you look at the autonomic nervous system or the visceral efferent, remember there are two divisions. There's a sympathetic division and a parasympathetic division. Well, because there are two divisions, we're going to have to talk about them separately. Let's look at them in general first. If you look at them, they are two neuron systems. It takes two neurons to get to from the central nervous system to the effector organ. And the effector organ is always an internal organ, something like smooth muscle or something like that. But they are two neuron systems, and they're going to synapse. They generally synapse in what's called a ganglion. So to designate these two neurons, we're going to call the first one the preganglionic neuron. And we're going to call the second one the postganglionic neuron. Same thing is true for the other division. If you look at the preganglionic neurons, they're type B neurons. Type B neurons, remember, are lightly myelinated and they're sort of medium fast. If you look at the postganglionic neurons, they are type C neurons. Type C neurons are unmyelinated and much slower. Well, because we have two neurons, we're going to have two synapses and two neurotransmitters. The neurotransmitter for the sympathetic division between the pre- and the postganglionic neurons is acetylcholine. The neurotransmitter between the postganglionic neuron and the effector organ is norepinephrine. If you look at the parasympathetic, the neurotransmitter between the pre- and postganglionic is acetylcholine, and the neurotransmitter between the postganglionic and the effector organ is acetylcholine. So preganglionics heavily myelinated extend to a ganglion. Second one is a postganglionics unmyelinated extends to an effector organ. Again different neurotransmitters. If we look at the 
preganglionics, they all release acetylcholine. Doesn't matter if it's sympathetic or parasympathetic. The difference comes between the postganglionics and the effector organs. Postganglionics of the parasympathetic release acetylcholine. Postganglionics of the sympathetic release norepinephrine. Let's look at the two divisions separately. And we're going to look at the parasympathetic nervous system first. Well, there are two nicknames for the parasympathetic nervous system, and they're descriptive. They describe something about it. One of them describes the anatomy of the parasympathetic uh, sympathetic nervous system, and that nickname is craniosacral. The other nickname is physiological. In other words, it describes the function of the parasympathetic nervous system. And that nickname is rest and digest. Sometimes it's called the SLUD system. SLUD is an acronym and it stands for salivation, lacrimation, urination, digestion, and defecation. And those are the primary things that this part of the nervous system controls. If we look at it, it looks like this. And so if we look at here, we can see it comes off of the central nervous system. Remember, there are two neurons. So the solid line represents the preganglionic neuron. The dotted line represents the postganglionic neuron. We can see ganglia. But if you notice, there are only four ganglia, and they're all in the head. Most of these preganglionic neurons synapse with the postganglionic neuron in the wall of the organ that they're going to. For instance, if you look at the heart, there's no ganglion there. It's just in the wall of the heart. If you look at the lung, there's no ganglion there. It's just in the wall of the lung and so on. Another thing you'll notice is this is not evenly distributed throughout the nervous system. It's concentrated. It's concentrated in cranial nerves and sacral nerves, which is where the nickname comes from. It's cranial nerves 3, 7, 9, and 10, and sacral nerves 2, 3, and 4. There are no parasympathetic fibers anywhere in between. Again, cranial nerves 3, 7, 9, and 10, sacral nerves 2, 3, and 4. And then we have some ganglia, a few. They're called terminal ganglia, but most of them synapse in the wall of the organ in which they're headed to. Let's look at those four terminal ganglia. Again, they're all in the head. They're the ciliary, the pterygopalatine, which is also called sphenopalatine, submandibular, and otic. And if we look at these, we can see them here. Remember what a ganglion is. It's where cell bodies are located. So this is where the cell bodies of the postganglionic neurons are located. Cell bodies are larger than axons, and when you put a bunch of them together, it increases the size. So these things look like bumps. But again, there are four of these. Ciliary, submandibular, otic, and pterygopalatine or sphenopalatine. Remember, however, most of these don't have a ganglion at all. They synapse in the wall of the organ. And then, remember, we have two neurons. They both release acetylcholine. So all preganglionic fibers release acetylcholine. And in the um, postganglionic fibers of the parasympathetic also release acetylcholine. The other nickname for the parasympathetic nervous system is the rest and digest. So if you take a look at all these organs to which they're headed, and then you keep those two words in your mind, you might be able to figure out what's going to happen if we activate these neurons. So if you're resting, which means sleeping, relaxing, watching TV, reading a book, something like that, you're at rest. There's a bunch of things that are going to be different than if you're exercising. If you're at rest, the pupils of your eyes are going to be small. 
your salivary glands will be working, your heart rate will be low and your blood pressure will be low. The tubes in your lungs close up a little bit so they can clean the air better because you don't need as much air. It's better to have it nice and clean. The liver tends to be storing stuff that you've just eaten because not only is it rest, remember it's also digest. The stomach is active. The, the pancreas is active. The small intestines and large intestines are very active. That activity can cause things like defecation, so the removal of the undigested waste products. It also causes urination, which is the removal of the nitrogenous waste products. So again, rest and digest. And so if you think about someone who's just finished a meal, might be a nice day, you decide to go to the park, you decide to get, I don't know, take out and take it to the park, spread out a blanket, have a nice meal. The sun is shining, the birds are singing and so on. And you begin to feel tired. You begin to feel sleepy. Your skin is warm. Your pupils are constricted. Your digestive system is going crazy. Your blood pressure, your heart rate, your respiration rates are all very low. And so... You might look something like this guy. So these are those parasympathetic effects. Relaxation, food processing, energy absorption, SLUD. And remember SLUD stands for salivation, lacrimation, that's tear production, urination, digestion and defecation. Let's look at the sympathetic nervous system. So the sympathetic nervous system also has these two nicknames and again they're descriptive. One of them is anatomical. It's going to describe the anatomy of the sympathetic nervous system and that's the rasolumbar. It's called that because these fibers are going to begin in the spinal cord, but not just everywhere in the spinal cord, only in the sections of the thoracic and lumbar part of the spinal cord. We also have a physiological nickname. That physiological nickname is the fight or flight, or sometimes fight or flight or fright nervous system. And so if you think about what your body's doing, if you're in a fight or if you're trying to get away from a fight or something has frightened you a whole lot, that's what's going to happen. And so if we look at this nervous system, again, look at these organs. And if you go down the list of the organs and you think about what, what it is that's going to happen if you are afraid, if you're exercising or fighting or running, any of those things, what happens is the pupils of your eyes dilate your salivary glands tend to shut down, so you get dry mouth. And if you've ever had to give a speech and you're nervous, you know exactly what that's like. The heart rate is much higher. It's pumping much, much stronger. And so the blood pressure is higher. The tubes and the lungs open up so you can get lots of air. The digestive system actually shuts down. And what the liver does, instead of storing those products, it begins to release those products back into the blood so that your tissues and cells can utilize them. These other systems also tend to shut down somewhat, although you can have release of urine and release of feces. If you look on the left side, you'll see that what happens here, sweat glands become activated. Blood vessels in the skin dilate, and your skin floods with blood. Let's look at the anatomy of the sympathetic nervous system first. Remember it's called thoracolumbar. The reason it's called that is because it begins in the spinal cord, but it is only located in the lateral horns of T1 to L2. 
So it's always going to begin in the lateral horns of T1 to L2, and then it's going to exit with those spinal nerves. Remember, we have to synapse, and so they're going to be ganglia. Well, if you look at the ganglia here, there are lots of them, and they run in a chain up and down each side of the spinal cord. So you'll have a ganglion and then you have a trunk, a ganglion and a trunk. And so they create this chain, almost like a chain of pearls. And that's where they're going to synapse. So if we look at this, you can see on the left-hand picture, these ganglia and these trunks. If you look on the right-hand side, it's blown up for you. And if you look at the lower picture, you'll see the red, the blue, and the green neurons. Look, they begin in the lateral horns. They're going to exit with the ventral root. And then the ventral root is right next to this chain of ganglia. And so what's going to happen is we're going to enter the chain, synapse, and then go back into the spinal nerve. Well, when you enter the chain, remember these are preganglionic neurons, which are type B. They're myelinated. Myelin is white. And so this bridge is called the white ramus communicans. Once it synapses, though, we have type C neurons, and type C neurons are unmyelinated. So remember, unmyelinated parts of the neuron are gray. And so this bridge is called the gray ramus communicans. So preganglionic fibers enter the chain through the white ramus communicans, and then they're going to synapse. Postganglionic fibers are going to return to the spinal nerves through the gray ramus communicans, and then they're going to travel to their respective organs. You can see that here. So the red here are preganglionic fibers. The black are postganglionic fibers. Now sometimes synapse doesn't happen immediately. Sometimes neurons travel up the chain or down the chain. They can even leave the chain and go to a ganglion that's not part of the chain. These are called collateral ganglia. So a collateral ganglia is still a ganglion. It's just not in this chain. So if we look at this, remember it's a two-neuron system. Preganglionic, we're going to release acetylcholine. Postganglionic, we're going to release norepinephrine. And norepinephrine is going to produce all those effects on the internal organs. There is one exception to this two-neuron rule. There's one place in the body where a preganglionic fiber goes all the way to its effector organ. That effector organ is the adrenal medulla. So if you look at this picture, look, the red fiber goes all the way to the adrenal medulla. Now you can see tiny little black ones in here, but that's because the adrenal medulla is a gland, but it's a neurogland. It produces neurotransmitters and then releases them into the bloodstream as neurohormones. This is the only exception to that two neuron rule. We still have the release of acetylcholine between the pre and postganglionic neurons. And then the postganglionic neurons are still going to produce norepinephrine and epinephrine and then release it into the bloodstream. That norepinephrine and epinephrine can go anywhere the bloodstream goes. Remember, we also had collateral ganglia. These are the ones that are not in the chain. And there are four collateral ganglia, and they're all in the abdomen. One is called celiac. One is called superior mesenteric. One is the inferior mesenteric. And one is the hypogastric. So if we look at this, we can see these collateral ganglia. There's a collateral ganglia right there. So if we look at this, this neuron, it starts here, it leaves, it goes by way of the ventral root, and then right here is our white ramus communicans. So it's going to come in, we're going to get synapse. It can go back the way we talked about before and continue on, but in this case it left the chain 
and went to this collateral ganglion. That's where the synapse occurred. And so you can see these four collateral ganglia. And again, they're all right here in the abdomen. If we look at the other nickname of the sympathetic nervous system, it describes its function. So remember the other nickname is the fight, fright, and flight nervous system. What it is, is it's sort of a, uh, an emergency system, a physiological emergency system. It's sort of like the body's 911. So if you think about your own situation, if you dial 911 from your home phone, a whole bunch of people are gonna show up at your house. The cops are gonna show up, the fire truck's gonna show up, the ambulance is gonna show up. Because they're not exactly sure what, what you're going to wind up needing, so they have to mobilize everything. And that's exactly the way the sympathetic nervous system is. It's a very, very interconnected system. And if we go back and look at this, you can see how interconnected it is. That's why we have these sympathetic chain ganglia, and that's why we have they're all hooked together. So if you activate one part of the sympathetic nervous system, you're basically going to activate the entire sympathetic nervous system. Well, what it does, it's going to prepare your body. It's going to prepare your body to fight off an enemy, to run away from something that's trying to hurt you, or the same thing happens if you become extremely frightful. It also happens just regularly during exercise. So during exercise, it's basically the same sort of situation if you, as if you were in fight or flight. And so what's going to happen is we're going to make adjustments to where the blood flow happens. So we're going to send more blood flow to the muscles and less to the organs. We're going to activate those muscles and inactivate those organs. Well, some organs are necessary for exercise, and so we're going to change things like heart rate and blood pressure. We're going to change things like respiration. It's going to become rapid and deep. The skin is also going to begin to sweat, because if you're exercising, you need to get rid of heat. We're going to pull blood away from the skin in case you have an injury and you don't bleed as much. The pupils are going to dilate so that you have bigger peripheral vision. So if you look at either one of these guys, they're both in fight or flight. And look, you can see some things besides the snarling and all that. Look, you can see their hair is standing up. That makes it harder for them to bite flesh. They just get a mouthful of hair. Think about what's going on with their heart rate, their blood pressure. Now remember, you can also sometimes get the loss of urine and feces if you're frightened enough. And so that might happen as well. Well, if we go back and look at these fibers, remember there are two fibers, so we're going to have two neurotransmitters. Preganglionic fibers release acetylcholine. Postganglionic fibers release norepinephrine and a little bit of epinephrine. And then don't forget, we have this one exception to this two neuron rule, and that's our adrenal medulla. So what's going to happen is preganglionic fibers go directly to the adrenal medulla. And when we stimulate the adrenal medulla, epinephrine and norepinephrine are going to be released into the bloodstream as neurohormones. And since blood goes everywhere, these hormones are going to go everywhere. So this system can have effects on organs that there's no neuron connected to. If you look at some of those organs, there are things like skeletal muscles, liver, heart, the bronchioles in your lungs, blood vessels, and so on. All of these are going to react when we activate the sympathetic nervous system. So we looked at these organs, and if you notice, the organs that we saw with sympathetic and the organs we saw with parasympathetic were almost identical. That's because we have something called dual innervation. And what dual innervation means is that where one division goes, 
the other division goes. And usually they're going to have opposite effects. So if you pick the lungs, they both go there. Remember, parasympathetic is going to make the tubes in the lungs constrict, whereas the sympathetic are going to make the tubes in the lungs dilate. The heart, they both go there. Parasympathetic is going to slow down the heart and reduce how hard the heart beats, whereas the sympathetic is going to increase the heart rate and increase the contraction strength. And that's true of all of these. So, dual innervation, opposite effects. So if you were to just look at a list, you could probably figure out all of these. So here's a few examples. So heart rate, what do you think is going to happen if parasympathetic is activated? What do you think is going to happen if the sympathetic is activated? And if you go down this whole list, you'll be able to uh, recognize it. So in general, what's going to happen with the sympathetic is we're going to increase heart and respiratory rates. We're going to eliminate or inhibit digestion and elimination. And then parasympathetic, we're going to do just the opposite. We're going to decrease heart and respiratory rate. We're going to allow for digestion and finally for the discarding of waste. There are a few places in the body where we have dual innervation, but we have cooperative effects. So cooperative effects means that they work together to produce the desired response. If either one of them isn't working, we don't get a complete response. And the best examples of this are in the external genitalia. It's true in males and females, but it's more obvious in males. So think about the male. In order to reproduce, a male has to do two things. The male has to achieve an erection so that the female reproductive tract can be penetrated. But that's not enough. The gametes also have to be left there. And that happens during ejaculation. So to be successful, the male has to provide both an erection and an ejaculation. Well, they're regulated by different parts of the autonomic nervous system. Erection is a parasympathetic effect. What happens is blood vessels in the penis dilate, and there are vascular tissues that fill with blood, and so the penis elongates, stiffens, and becomes rigid enough to penetrate the female reproductive tract. Ejaculation, though, is a sympathetic effect. So once the male is sufficiently excited, what happens is contractions of smooth muscles happen throughout the reproductive tract. And the sperm, along with fluids, are forced out of the penis and left into the female reproductive tract. Well, if either one of these doesn't happen, reproduction is not going to be successful. And because they're controlled by different parts of the nervous system, they can act independently. So you can have erection with no ejaculation, and you can have ejaculation with no erection. Again, dual innervation. Remember this is true in the female as well as the male. So in the female, something very similar to what happens in the penis happens in the clitoris. In the female, something very similar to what happens in the male happens in the female as well. There are a few places in the body, though, where we do not have dual innervation. We only have single innervation, which means that only one division has neurons that go to those organs. A few places like this are the adrenal medulla. Only the sympathetic goes there. The sympathetic also only goes to the sweat glands, the erector pili muscles, those things that make hair stand on end, and the kidneys, and most blood vessels. Parasympathetics do not have fibers to these structures. And then there are a few places, namely the lacrimal glands, where only the parasympathetic fibers go. So if we look at this picture again and we 
figure out the things. Here on the left side of this picture, those are the structures that the sympathetic goes to, but the parasympathetic does not. And so you can see sweat glands, erector pili muscles, the blood vessels and the skin and so on. If you look at the parasympathetic, on the right side, we can see the lacrimal gland is where parasympathetic only fibers go. So that's the autonomic nervous system.